Welcome, welcome, welcome to this English speaking union happy hour, antique appraisals, what is it, what's it worth, let's do some with Robin Sinclair. I'm as always Joshua Kebel Gonzalez, Director of Branch Services at the English speaking union of the United States. As ideas for these lectures come from you, our members and viewers, please share any ideas or topics for an upcoming speaker or talk using the survey that will appear at the end of our program tonight. Before we get into that program, I want to make a couple of technical announcements. There will be a question and answer session if time allows at the end of this presentation. To submit your questions, please use the dedicated Q and A and chat modules that are at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can submit them during any point of the presentation, but they will be answered in the order received during the dedicated Q&A section. I also wanna take a moment to recognize the branches with the most registered members. They are the Atlanta, Central Florida, and Charleston branches. Now to really start us off today, I'd like to welcome ESU Happy Hour Committee Chair and ESU Central Pennsylvania Branch President, Karen Blair Brandt. Karen? Okay, I should be unmuted. Uh, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. I would like to thank Josh for all his help with our ESU events over this last uh, year and plus. And um, it's a pleasure here uh, having the afternoon, a uh, lovely day, a spring day here, or spring day, fall day here in uh, central Pennsylvania. Um, yes, and please do submit your, your uh, speakers uh, because we're looking for new ones for next year. And we'd love to showcase uh, folks from your branch uh, as well as a speaker. Uh, this afternoon, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Susan Robin Sinclair, who has been on the National Board of the English Speaking Union for two terms. She will now be rotating off this fall from the board. 
Robin worked on the strategic plan, which clarified our mission, connecting people through language and set goals for our national organization. She has been active in ESU for many years. A note about the uh, Nashville branch Robin wanted me to share with you. The Nashville branch planned their fall ranch speaker dinner just as COVID began, uh, which, you know, we couldn't get together. So they had to cancel that dinner, uh, but they have kept their reservation at the Nashville Women's Club, and that is great. And they will hold this event as soon as COVID restrictions end and they can get together again. Won't that be wonderful, Robin? Uh, now, without further ado, please let me turn the program over to Robin for you to learn all about antique appraisals. Thank you so much. Seat back, relax. Take it away, Robin. Okay, that's great. Um, let's start with the drink since this is supposed to be a happy hour. Uh, as a Scot, I proposed it be a wee dram. And this is a wee dram glass, uh, silver glass. And I have already poured myself a glass, but I thought I, a, a wee dram, but I thought I would show you uh, the two poles, Lefroy, 10 years old. This is a mighty Isla. Most people compare it to drinking a campfire. Um, I happen to love it. Um, this is Lagavulin, 11 years, which kind of is a less, it's a small, camp, very small campfire with just a hint of campfire. And then the Macallan, which you've all probably seen, which is a little bit sweeter single malt. And a wee dram, three drops of water, five if you insist, and you should sip, smell, Think of the highlands. Be, we're under a bit of a handicap because we don't have a fire and it's not cold. We should be sitting by a small fire. It should be cold outside. We should be telling each other stories and thinking of the highlands and being at one with Scotland. Kind of a handicap, but we'll do our best. So let's start with some appraisals. I've been an appraiser for several years uh, to Scotland first. Mm. And let's start with what appraisal is. An appraisal, what you are getting in this session is not exactly an appraisal. A true appraisal is a written report which is signed and dated by the appraiser. In other words, you put your neck on the line and uh, it should detail the object. It should tell what the object is. It should give you a description. It should give you a value. It should give you a type of value. And all of those are things that make a real appraisal. What I'm giving you right now is a verbal opinion. That's a little different. It is a different quality. And I had, a, I do have another caveat, which is I'm working from photographs. So sometimes I'll have to say, I'm not sure about this because I just couldn't tell from the photograph. And, there, and, and I'm not handling the objects. So let's start with our first appraisal. And I'm going to try to get to all of them. I will refer to notes. I know what the stuff is, but occasionally I need to remind myself what a particular date or something is. So I'm gonna be looking at my notes occasionally here. What we have here is a Polaroid Model 1 step camera. Now these cameras came out in 1977 um, and the original one step had a stripe on it to indicate that it could do color. Um, Edward Land, was the founder of Polaroid. And his great goal was to allow everyone to have instant photography. This was his goal. And this was very, very popular. Now this particular camera dates to about 1983. It's a perfect example. This is very useful. It's a perfect example of a collector's piece that should perform a function. It is worth more if it performs a function, okay? 
Uh, in this case, you have to have film for this particular camera. They are, that film is available. You have to kind of special order it. You can get it on the internet. Um, however, if we flip through, uh, Josh, could you move the, yeah. Here's another view of the camera, okay? Now, the next picture will show you our question. Um, this camera, the next one, has a UK, that's a UK plug. And so therefore it can only be used with an adapter unless you're in the UK. So the value is cut somewhere because it's somewhat in the United States because most people don't have an adapter and adapter would be an additional cost. And um, it, that's just an issue in value. So in working condition, I would estimate this camera to be worth about $60. If it is not working, it's worth about 20. And that is a display piece for display only. And that's the way I would typically sell it in the United States because of the UK plug. Okay, our second item is a Remington razor. Uh, Maybe familiar to some of us. Um, what we have here is an electric razor in absolutely mint condition in its original travel case. It dates about 1967. And the, 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 the selectronic part of this, it's called a selectro. What it meant was that for the first time you could have an electric razor that you could actually adjust. So the amount of connection you had with the blade, the, the moving blades, could be greater or lesser. And that was a real innovation. It was a new thing. Previously, electric razors had only one choice. Um, so this razor probably was a Christmas gift and was never used. It's a great example of mint condition. Um, these tend to sell for $20 to $30 in perfect condition with the cord. And as you can see, this was probably never used or if used very, very lightly. So I'd say 20 to $30, maybe 40, uh, if it has the cord and the box and everything. Okay, I'm moving a little bit rapidly because I wanna to try to cover all of our submissions and we have some wonderful ones. Um, and I loved having those two because they really show a very modern, modern object and that is in a question of working condition. And that applies to every sort of machine thing that needs to work uh, to some degree. Okay, what we have here, this I am absolutely in love with this piece because I love Victorian furniture. Um, you can probably see from the back of my study that I happen to like Victorian things and English things. Um, this wonderful piece, it's a true classic of Victorian furniture. It is absolutely period. It would have belonged to a well-to-do family in the 1850s, and it's generally called Renaissance Revival. That's what we usually call this typepiece. Um, so it's 1850s, could have been made in the 60s. Um, in the South, this was from New York. This was in a home in New York. In the South, nothing was made between 1860 and 1865. It didn't, nothing was made. In the North, however, this could have been made in, the, in 1862. Um, the market, however, at the moment, and we have to talk about this when we talk about appraisals, we have to talk about market value. And the market does not reward Victorian furniture right now. But look at this beautiful, beautiful cartouche. Look at the broken arch, the, the, the top. Um, these beautiful concave lines, those are very hard to make. Look at that beautiful piece of white marble, pristine, wonderful condition. Look at the look at these 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 cutouts around the edges, the shaped shelf. This is just a lovely piece. And with the piece was submitted a description of the house that it sat in in um, Saratoga, I believe it's in New York, a state. And um, it said it had Jenny Lynn's um, face was above the windows on the on each window. Uh, and it made me want to be in the room. Uh, Jenny Lynn came to America in, in 1850. She was brought by P.T. Barnum and she was a great success. 
and it, people went wild over it. And I would suggest that, and this is a wonderful example of, please write down all of that description of the house, the room this beautiful piece was in, give the name, give the address, give the line of descent, and put it with the piece. Put it with the piece, put it in that beautiful drawer that I'm gonna show you in just a second, this one. Look at the beautiful wood. That's what wood should look like after 150 years. It's not faked, it's not been monkeyed with, it's great. Um, but all of that, all that history will be lost. You can write it all down, you can put it in one of your files, but it doesn't, isn't with the piece. Make two copies, put a copy in the piece, and then we have it all there together. We know where this gorgeous thing once sat. And I have to comment on that, that beautiful drawer, um, but look at that wonderful pressed glass that the, the, sub, the person who submitted it said had always sat there. Um, this is American pattern glass, lion pattern. It was my father's favorite pattern. Um, and lion is period for this piece. Maybe it's a little bit later. We usually date lion about 1870. So, but it, it's just totally appropriate, totally in period and absolutely gorgeous. The white marble, the drawer. When I see a drawer like that, I have true validation as an appraiser. I love to see a period drawer. Uh, that's just right. And uh, this piece is a true piece of intact Americana. I would value this piece to sell for about $500 at auction, though I believe that it's quality. It should sell for about four times that. And in the future, I believe it will. The marketplace at the moment simply does not reward Victorian like it should, but you cannot buy this quality today. It is not being made. And um, I believe Victorian furniture is hurt a little bit by its size. Victorian furniture is large, um, but I believe that again, it will be inherently valued. And thank you for submitting this absolutely wonderful piece. Beautiful American walnut, by the way. Um, next. We're all over the board, and this is what's fun about being an appraiser. I'm a generalist, and I like all kinds of stuff, so it's fun. Um, this lovely little music box, isn't it charming? It's, um, it's from the 1950s, 60s, right after World War II, made in West Germany sometime in that period. Um, the case was made in West Germany, the works by the firm of Thorens. Now, Thorens is a Swiss music box maker from the 1880s, I believe they were established in 1883. And they were famous for music boxes. And later on, ironically enough, they made electric shavers and turntables um, because it was precision metal work. Um, there are many types of music boxes. Their value is dependent upon the number of songs they sing, uh, play, and their condition. Um, there are big, beautiful table boxes that play 20, 10 songs or whatever, they have rotating cylinder. This, this one sings, uh, plays, excuse me, um, plays one song. Um, the value is dependent on the elaborateness of the case, the age, and again, is it in working condition, okay? Um, so, what I want to say about that, however, is that the figures here are typical of German toys. It's so charming. It's a delightful little piece. Uh, I would value it at about $150 to $200. And you did the right thing to have it gently restored uh, so that the little flowers were, are still there and in great condition. It's a great little box. And I would say $150 to $200 on this lovely little, little treasure. Okay, now for something completely different. This is Scrimshaw. You may have heard the term Scrimshaw. Scrimshaw, I was delighted to get this submission. It is an amazing piece of Americana. Um, Scrimshaw is a term for drawing on ivory. Now there are all different kinds of ivory. You may have heard of elephant ivory. There are many different kinds of ivory. There's about seven or eight 
Uh, this is whale ivory. This is a sperm whale tooth. Um, and sperm whales are the only tooth whales that are big enough to have this size teeth. So you know it's a sperm whale, there's no question. Uh, and they were the main prey, not the only prey, but they were one of the main preys of the American whaling ships in the great period of American whaling, which is 1820 to about 1850. Um, it went on until the 90s. It pretty well was finished by the 1890s. So this is the period of American whaling. This is the period of Moby Dick. You've all heard of Moby Dick. This is that period. They were on sailing ships to do whaling. It was very dangerous. Um, anyway, this particular tooth is a wonderful example. It not only shows the whaling business. Let's see another slide. Here they are. There's the sailing ship. Here they are out in the little boat chasing whales. It's carved and impressed. They actually was a little chisel with a carbon that was put in to draw the picture. This is actually cut into the surface of a whale's tooth. And it is, then there's a whale. We can see it on the picture uh, with the flag um, all over it. There's another further out, you can see the whaling ships went out. This is exactly what is in Moby Dick over and over and over. Um, now, these, these things were done by sailors to supplement their pay. There was no use for sperm whale teeth except to make trinkets. And one of the, the, the sailors actually did this to supplement their pay. Because remember, it took three, four, sometimes five years before you could get back to port after you left. This is, this is something we just don't understand now. I think this was a gift to this man with his portrait. And we know this man, we know something else about this man. He's a navigator. If you look down at his hands, and this is a different picture, there it is. See what he's holding? He's holding a map and a pair of dividers. Now those dividers allow you to measure distance in nautical miles. And they're used in conjunction with a latitude scale on a nautical map. So we have to remember, and I put this in my notes to make sure I noted it. We have to remember that going to the South Seas was, was kind of like going to the moon. I mean, it was probably harder. Um, it took two to five years. You had to go all the way around South America and up to the Arctic or to the South Seas. There were no the weather forecasts. There was no rescue and there was no help. Once you were out of sight of land, you were on your own. Um, now, let's deal with the family history. So we know this man's a navigator and we know from his hairstyle, this dates about 1820s. Right, 1820s, 1825, his shirt front, his hairstyle, everything is of that period. So is the whaling ship because and so are the, even the hats on the sailors are that period. So the client tells me, and I'm, all of these are anonymous submissions. I'm not telling who has anything. She tells me it came from an ancestor, Captain John Adams Webster, who lived from 18, 1789 to 1877 and was a celebrated hero of the War of 1812. Ah. Oh. Okay, that fits. He was a customs and port officer the, for the main part of his life. Okay, so I would date this piece right in that period, 1820 to 30, by his hair and uniform, so it all fits. And now, here's my suggestion. First of all, I think this piece deserves an appraisal report, a written, look at the beautiful work down here framing the picture. All of this is on the whale tube, beautifully done. Um, I would strongly suggest an appraisal report in full, detailing the piece, telling the values, signing off on it, authenticating all of this. And I would suggest very strongly that the line of descent 
be included with the peace, including the names and dates of his descendants, how the peace passed through the family, that's called provenance. And that adds enormously to the value. Now, I am going to give a value based on the idea that this piece has those things that we can supply, and it shouldn't be terribly difficult, that we can supply who his descendant was, to whom the tooth passed, his next descendant, and so forth. So we can establish a line of provenance for this piece. I don't think there's any question about the authenticity, but an appraisal report is what is needed here with a piece of this quality. And now we have to think about value. Okay, I would expect that this piece, based on perfect condition, and as far as I can tell, it has that. Again, I did not handle it, so I can't promise that, but I feel it's true. And it's provenance, which should be fully documented, and it's depiction of the whaling trade, and it's portrait of an American hero of the War of 1812. This man had two swords given to him by the state of Maryland for his heroism. And I believe this is another gift to him in tribute to his heroism in the War of 1812. I think this is at least a $25,000 piece based on all of that. Um, a superb piece of Americana, which again needs its history and needs really good document and is worthy of documentation. This is an important piece. Thank you very much for submitting it. It has been a joy to, to work on this piece because I did have to do a little looking up on this particular person and some other things. So it's just a great piece. Thank you so much. Now we have another interesting submission. I, I need a sip of Lafroy. hold on. Now, this is a box of silver, okay? And this, this illustrates the problem of working from photos. I'm an old fashioned appraiser. I like to see, feel and touch my objects. That way I know what I'm working with. If you get an appraiser, by the way, who tells you they know everything, get rid of them. Uh, nobody knows everything. If you get an appraiser who doesn't want to handle your stuff, get rid of them. I like to touch and handle the things because they speak to me. They tell me a lot and silver really does. Um, now, I would love to feel the silver because Jensen Silver, and this is by Jensen, has a wonderful feel. It's magical to touch Jensen Silver and handle it. Um, sterling Silver has a feel. I, I can tell Sterling Silver in the dark with a blindfold on almost. Uh, there's just a feel to it. I know what it is by my fingers. So I would like to check this entire box to see that it all matches, that it's all in good condition, and I haven't. So I have to give some conditional comments on this piece. Um, all of my comments are based on the idea. These are serving, very serving pieces. All my comments here are based on the idea that all these pieces of flatware are sterling silver. That is 925 sterling standard, which is the same thing as sterling. That means out of a thousand parts of metal, 925 are silver. And the other 75 are usually copper, almost all copper. Occasionally there's something else in there. And the reason that is done is not to cheat the customer. You put that copper in there to harden it, to make it more um, stronger. It's just the facts. Um, this is acorn pattern by Jensen, George Jensen. Um, it is the most popular Jensen pattern. Uh, and But there are several other patterns. He made several. This was first made in 1915. Um, he, it's a Danish, and his pieces are marked with a circle and Jensen on the back. 
there is an American pattern which closely copies Jensen called Royal Danish by, Inter by American Company International. I looked very carefully as much as I could, and I believe this is all Jensen. There might be a piece of international um, uh, Royal, um, Royal Danish uh, in there, but I don't think so. I believe it's all Jensen. Um, so what I believe I have here is a service of Jensen Silver. I have since found out that it is more than a full canteen. A canteen is service for 12. Okay, and silver services are flatware are measured in canteens. So you have a half canteen is six service for six flatware. This is fork, spoon, knife, not serving pieces. Uh, canteen, half canteen service for six, full canteen service for 12, double canteen service for um, 24, uh, triple canteen service for 36. Uh, and you can go up from there. Okay, so it's measured in 12s, basically. Uh, I have found out that there are 11 knives. Um, so it's one short there. Um, there's some, some things that I'd like to go over this piece, this set, make sure they're all, the, they've got 12 of everything and what you lack and all of that. But anyway, um, what I believe I have here is full canteen seven pieces per person plus serving pieces, which means three forks, uh, two knives, two spoons, serving pieces such as tongs, um, um, little serving spoons, big serving spoons. Um, if this is all Janssen at about uh, 240 pieces, which is the, the count I, I have at the moment, and all of it is Janssen, and all of it is in good condition. Um, at auction, the value would be between ten and sixteen thousand dollars. And depending on the number of serving pieces, how large they are, and how important they are, uh, the retail value is between twenty-four thousand and thirty-four thousand dollars. Very wonderful set of silver. Um, so, wonderful set. Um, next piece. And I don't know, how, are we doing okay on time? I've not been looking at time at all. I'm very bad about time. Um, anyway, okay. Doing well on time, Robin. Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, doing well on time. Okay, great. Uh, Josh keeps me, keeps me in order. He's great. Uh, and I, we really do owe a lot to Josh. Josh does a wonderful, wonderful job, and he's so thorough. I really appreciate his work and puts up with those of us who are not very technically savvy. Um, now, what we have here is a piece of Americana, another wonderful piece of Americana. Uh, it dates 1858. It's a Courier and Ives print. Now, Courier and Ives prints are what we call stone lithographs. They were then hand colored. So they were made, they were made in black and white print with a stone, literally a stone, they were carved onto a stone. Then that, that production was then hand colored um, and sold. And they did them by the thousands. Um, they were different sizes, they had different themes. They were in every home in the 19th century in America. And they just were, if you had any wealth at all. These were not in the homes of the, they were in the White House. They were in uh, wealthy families. They were also in families that were middle class or, or, or not even quite middle class. Um, they were very, very popular. Of course, the bigger, the more elaborate, the series, more, all of these things added expense. But Courier and Ives were very populous. They sold a lot and there, are th there were thousands. Uh, they came out in series after series. They did stages of life. They did American scenes. They did American seasons. They did figures from American history. 
um, they're just a very important part of life and of the visual life of Americans in the 19th century after about, I think the first ones date about 1830s, maybe 40s, but these are primarily mid, mid to mid-century. When you, when you think mid 19th century, think Courier and Ives. That's into the, back, down into the 1880s, 70s, 80s. These were very popular, okay? But they have a problem. They are on paper. And that means they are rather fragile. Now in this piece, I can see, and it's a wonderful example of condition problems. Um, that is not a, the fault of the piece. It's simply true. Paper, things on paper have condition issues often. And I will explain, a, a paper conservator could deacidify this piece. You see down at the bottom, if you look at the very bottom of that frame, you see that brown, see those brown, that brown line, that brown stuff? It's called foxing, okay? And that foxing is basically um, acid eating into that, into that paper. Now, if you show the last, the back of this piece, Josh, I'll tell you where that acid's coming from right there. This is an original frame. This is the way they were framed. You put wood on the back of them so they'd be nice and sturdy. Well, the wood has acid in it and it eats into the paper over time. And that's why when you have a piece of paper or silk or other substances and it's framed, you should have it carefully, not reframed, but it should be taken off, taken the, those wooden panels taken off, go to a paper conservator, have it deacidified it, and have it re-backed with acid-free board or mounting, mounting material. You can put the wood back, but there needs to be a good shield between the paper object and the wood. Um, that is very important and that is not your fault. That is not Courier and I's fault. Nobody knew that the acid would eat into the back. So um, now uh, there's another little problem. If you flip the piece back over, um, it also has some fading. That also happens, that happens from sun. It can happen also from acid in the back. Uh, so, this has some fading. It's not got a lot. Now, this is an original framing, but when it was framed, the margins were cut. On Courier and Ives, that cuts down on value. If you'll notice the edges, you see how that doesn't have much margin there? That margin has been cut. And that is something people who collect Courier and Ives, and there is a lively market in Courier and Ives, look for margins. So that's another issue in terms of value. Now, the subject is, it is a large, he's a large courier and Ives piece. And the subject is Indians, the frontier, horses. This is very high in demand subject. So that adds value. Indians are always popular subjects. And this subject, this scene is filled with action. It's got horses, it's got Indians, it's got a cavalryman, a frontiersman. And there's some sort of a story about a whip or a lasso. And I can't tell which, it's called the surprise. Obviously he pulls out either a lasso or a whip and surprises the Indian. I could not find the story. It must be very familiar to people of that time. I don't know what it is. If I had more time, I probably could find it out, but it, it, I couldn't in this short time I had. Um, the whip, I think, is a surprise. Maybe it's a lasso, but I think it's a whip. It could be a, anyway. Um, but the story would have been very familiar to the audience. I would estimate with all of these caveats, and as I'm going through the process, I'm letting you see the issues that we have when we assign value. I have to take into account all of these factors. Um, so I would estimate this piece would sell for $1,500 to $2,000 at auction. 
And I would guess it would be about three to four at a dealer. Uh, you may wonder at the difference. Um, and let me explain that very quickly. An auction has no responsibility. If you carefully read the contract, an auction labels, they try to label, but they say they do not bear any responsibility for the piece. A dealer does. And when you deal with a dealer, you should always get a written receipt which tells what the piece is and what the period of the piece is. I recently had a client who had a table that had they bought from a dealer years ago, had a signed receipt that it was an 18th century English table. That table was no more 18th century than I am. It was um, probably from 19, about 1960s, 50s or 60s. It, uh, it, it was not a period piece. And it was on the receipt that it was. And I said, well, it's been many years ago, but that is not an accurate receipt. Um, and of course it was, had been 40, 50 years ago, it was not an operative question. But that's the dealer bears a responsibility. And if they won't give you a written receipt detailing the information, I suggest that you think about, think very seriously before buying something. On the other hand, the dealer has to wait until the right buyer comes along. And so I don't mind them making a good profit. That often you'll hold a piece for a year, two years three years before you buy it, sell it. Rapid turnover doesn't happen. This piece is a beautiful piece, but you might have to hold it for two or three years before you sell it. And now we come to something very different. This is what's fun about what I do. I, I'm a generalist, so I get all this sorts of things and I love it. Hmm. This, what we have here is two, a pair of very large, very attractive, obviously oriental vases. They appear to be Japanese. And let's see the slide of the other one as well. So we get a size, okay. We see the, the samurai warrior. We see the geishas or the ladies, Japanese ladies, we see this, okay. So they appear to be Japanese and they are in the style of the mid 19th century. Now that period is called the Meiji period and it dates from 1868 to 1912. It's almost exactly synonymous with the Victorian period. And it is very similar to the Victorian period. That period is, um, it corresponds in time, but also in aesthetic. Meiji items, they're over the top. They're very elaborate. They're often big. They're, they're, um, they're just over the top. Um, a lot of these sc screens you see that have birds done all in bone and stuff, some of those are Meiji. Um, that was very typical of that period. Um, now, the next question comes, which is what I have to do every time something comes across my desk. Okay. I know what these are saying they are. Let's see if they really are telling me the truth, okay? Um, they say they're Meiji period, they say they're Japanese. Now, let's look at these closely. I don't see any signs of age on these pieces. If they're really Japanese Meiji, they've been around for 150 years, okay? 125, 150 years. I need to see some evidence of it. Have we got a close up or can we get one, Josh? Do you see any signs of wear on this piece? Okay, let's look at those handles up at the top. That's gilding. Do I see any loss of gilding? Obviously they're big, so they wouldn't have been handled a lot, but they would have been handled some. I don't see anything. Okay, that's starting to give me some questions. Oh, uh, look at those figures. Uh, those are supposed to be foo dogs 
but it's kind of hard to tell what they are. They're kind of lumpy looking. Not only do they not have any wear on them, but they're kind of, kind of hard to determine. Foo dogs, you usually can really see the eyes, the bulging eyes, the, uh, the, the teeth. These look, they, they just look like they, they're on steroids. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not feeling happy about that. Um, now let's look at that gilding. Let's look at let's look at the way this mirage is done. Now, mirage is a Japanese technique. It means piling up, and you did it by putting more. You you fired it, then you would put this um, extra clay slip on top of the piece. You see all these little dots. That's mirage work. Okay. Uh, and they were done by hand with, uh, they were raised and it added enormously to the value of a piece of porcelain because it all had to be done by hand. It was expensive to do, it required a lot of work. These look kind of mechanical. That doesn't look like it. Look, and then look at the bands, how the painting kind of comes, it's, it's not real, real, really inside those lines. The mariage looks, looks a little mechanical. Now let's go down and look at the faces. Let's look at the faces. Faces are wonderful for telling me things. Look at how the horse is just kind of standing there. In a Japanese vase of this period, the horse would have had his head turned to the side. The samurai would be moving back in some way. He might not be walking, but he'd have movement. The ladies would be would be more frontal. There's a lot of this is stiff. It's very stiff and copybook feeling. So they they don't feel Japanese. And there's a difference between the Chinese aesthetic and the Japanese aesthetic. The Japanese aesthetic is often asymmetrical. It's often characterized by movement. I don't mean that this, this is broad brush now. Um, so I, I don't feel these figures, I feel they're stiff. And they don't seem to me to be living and moving much. Um, and they should be. If they are Japanese of the Meiji period, they should be. Okay, now having said all that, I have to remember I'm working from photographs. I've not handled these pieces, okay? And that's true of everything I've done in this hour. If I were doing an appraisal, I, a report, I would put in that report as a limiting condition that I had not handled these pieces in person, um, which I don't like to do, but sometimes you have to do it. Um, but based on the photographs, I have a conclusion, okay? Haven't handled the pieces, I'm saying that. Right up front. I do not believe these are Japanese and I do not believe they are Meiji period. Um, I believe they are well done modern Chinese copies of Japanese vases. And I think they were probably done in the last 10 to 20 years. Um, I have seen some of these uh, that were done in Chinese family rose, which is the, the export porcelain you've seen with roses on it. I've seen those done. I saw a big dish a few years, a couple of years ago, and it had some experts food, but I kept looking at it and applying these same things. What is the quality of the work? Does it feel stiff? Does it feel mechanical? Does it feel like it was done from a copy book? Do I see any spontaneity in it? Um, and those fooled some experts, but I have to conclude that I think these are Chinese copies. They have decorative value. They're very attractive. So I would value these as a pair at three to $400 for their decorative value. They're very large and beautiful. And a lot of people would like to have them. And that's what I would, would put as a value, three to $400 maybe. Yeah, that's about right, um, three to four. Now, this is our last one, and I'm glad because it's a terrible death to be talked to death, and I'm sure you all have got some questions.
questions, let's look at this test. Now, I'm going to conduct the same inquiry that I just did on the vases. I'm going to conduct, I'm going to, I'm going to interrogate this desk. Um, the first thing that this desk tells me is it is a slant front desk with um, sort of Louis the 16th legs, 15th leg, really 15th legs. It's got extensive marquetry. Now, marquetry is not painted. Marquetry is actually inlaid wood. It's patterns in decoration inlaid into the, into the wood um, with a, usually, almost always, with a lighter colored wood. Often that wood is box or yew. It, sometimes it's painted, sometimes it's been dyed. Um, and that is very common. And it, this style is very common in Italy. It was done in Italy a lot. It's still being done in Italy. Um, so when I look at this desk, let me take a sip of water. I see an Italian desk with extensive marquetry. Absolutely correct. It has a slant front with drawers. Now my next question is, okay, I've got a nice attractive piece of furniture, okay. What period is it? Well, it's in the style of 1550. That's the style. Uh, maybe a little later, but it's that's when this sort of thing started really being done a lot. Okay, now is this piece of 1550? No, absolutely not. It is not. Why do I know it's not? Well. Once again, look for signs of age. Do I see a lot of signs of age? If this desk has been open and closed since 1550, let's give it another 100 years. Let's say since 1650, okay? If it's been open and closed since 1650, would it look like that? No, it would not. Would those hinges look like that? Would those cuts around the top? And I'm, I'm gesturing, of course, you can't see it, but I'm tracing the shape of the, of where the front fell, where the fall front, I'm tracing that square line. It's too straight, it's too clean. That hasn't been, that hadn't been used since 1650. Let's give it another hundred years, 1750. No. Um, so now the question is, what is that age? Okay, well, then let's look at the sides of the drawers. We're seeing the marquetry. We know that took a lot of doing. Let's look at the side of the drawer. Josh, I've got a shot in there of the drawer. The next, there, there we go. Look at the side. This is why appraisers love to look under and inside of things. We find all kinds of stuff. That's an oak side drawer. That means this is a pretty well-made piece. Oak is strong. Makes for nice drawers. I love oak drawers, particularly sides. It's got nice dovetails, which that makes it tighter. That's good. These are not hand cut dovetails. They're made to look kind of like they might be. They're not hand, hand cut dovetails. Okay, so what do I say then? Okay, I'm thinking this desk is probably 19th century, 1800s. Okay maybe 1800s. I'm going to keep in my mind, it could be late 1800s, let's say 1850, 60, 70, 80, 90. I'm thinking that's possible. Oak sides, this is, this is a well-made piece, but not 1760. Okay, now let's look at the, let's look at this set of drawers. Look how those drawers are set flush against the frame. See how there's no molding, extra cutting, uh, nothing extra has been done to make that attractive. And I, I have to, tr you just have to trust me, if this had been done earlier, you would have extra molding, something around so that when the drawers went in, it was attractive. It was not just plain. 
Um, so that tells me that this is a later piece as well. Um, now, I'm going to say that this is, is from, it's very difficult to, to date this piece exactly, particularly from photographs, but in, in general, because the Italians have continued to make this style desk and do marquetry for a long, long, long time. And they're good at it and they know how to do it. Um, I would date this, I'm gonna give a wide range because I can't be sure, but I would date this between the late 19th, which is 1890 to 1950. It could have been made anywhere in that time period. Uh, it's very difficult to tell. Um, the, the face here is, is well done. The Italians have been doing this. They really know how to do it. And you see some signs of age here. See those little dots down there? But I'm finding they're in a rather odd place because why would they be there? Um, maybe there was damage. Maybe the wood was already damaged and then this marquetry was put on top. I, I'm really not sure of that. I kind of think that it happened afterward, but I'm not sure. I can't be sure. The face is charming. The face is nice. I like the, I love the face. I love the marquetry. Um, that's a good example of the inset eyes there. They're either colored or they're a different color wood, maybe, maybe either. And see the whites of the eyes are done with, with either, extra wood that was put in and colored. This was made and then put into the, into the piece. Italians do it beautifully. They've done it for years. I'm going to value this piece at about 500 to 700 at auction. And I'm gonna put it at 1200 to 1500 retail. Uh, I think it's in that ballpark. I think it's a nice piece. I think a lot of people would want it. Um, so, um, that's it. That's all of our submissions. And I did them in order of submission. Uh, as they came in, that's the order I did them. So, um, questions or comments? Yeah, I think we have time for a few, quite, maybe one or two. We have about three minutes left in the program. So if anyone has any questions, none came in during the appraisals. But if you have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A module or the chat module to enter them. We'll be looking out for any questions here. Also, uh, Robin, I do want to thank you because it's one of these things where, you know, I never expect objects to provide such a window into history, into the past that they do. But it's, it's, it's fascinating hearing about all these different objects and the really kind of unique uh, kind of experiences the objects had and that what they tell us about history. So thank you. I thought that was fascinating. Excuse me, I'm muted. Um, it's a, Mark Twain said, it's a terrible death to be talked to death, but uh, I wanted to make sure that I covered the material and gave as much information as I could. Um, I see someone asks, how can you find a reputable appraiser? Um, you can look at a list of appraisers. You can contact me and I can look to see who's in your area. Um, which I'd be glad to do. Um, let me tell you, I'm going to tell you a tiny story. Um, a few years ago, I had a lady tell me, I was saying something about, now these are antiques, and she said, um, I know, I know all about antiques. And I said, how wonderful for you, because nobody knows everything. And I always say, you don't want the best cataract man in Nashville setting your hip, okay? So the person who says they know everything, number one, they're wrong. And number two, you want for a particular object, I had a client the other day who had a, a baseball card collection. And I just told them up front, I said, you don't want me to appraise baseball cards. I barely know how many bases there are. And I sure don't know who played with Mickey Mantle. So, and that, that's a huge deal in baseball cards. So we need to find you someone else to do that. And that's perfectly fine. Um, 
don't call me for baseball cards, but if you will send me a, a message uh, and, and let me know your area, uh, and then I will tell you, uh, I'll look at the list and see if I, there's anyone I know up there that I feel is, is really competent to, to do the job. But you don't want someone who comes in and tells you they know everything, and you don't want someone who is not willing to sign on the dotted line and put their neck on the line to a value. I had another client a few years ago, and I'll hush after this one, but it's one of my favorite stories. They had paid for an appraisal, um, and it was for an object that was not in my field, particularly, um, and they had had it done. And I said, this is not an appraisal. This is an offer to buy. And that's different. A good appraiser, absolutely 100% should not make an offer to buy. It is a conflict of interest. And that, that is a, if you do that, it is a totally separate transaction and must be separate from the appraisal process. It is, if you think of an appraiser as being like a doctor or a lawyer, we have a fiduciary duty. And that fiduciary duty is very important. And we are not, absolutely not, to be buying and appraising at the same time. That is totally, completely wrong. Okay? We do have a few more questions. Let's sure. see. So I think this is a, a great one from Elizabeth Freund who asks, what are the best questions to ask when shopping for antiques? Ah, okay. What a wonderful question. I love it. And you may have to shut me up on this one. The first question you need to ask is what do you think this is? The second question you need to ask is, what are the problems with this piece? The third question you need to ask is, how was this made? I'll show you a piece right here that I've been drinking my wee dram from. This is a handmade piece of silver. I saw the man work on it. He hand cut these pieces in here. That's a very old way to work silver. It will not leak, it's made in one piece. There is no seam at the bottom, the seam is here. <laughs> that is how it was made. I know how it was made. A good antique dealer should be able to tell you how it was made. And they should be able to give you some information about it. And then you should go back and check that information. And when you purchase it, you should ask that question and have it on the receipt. Period, what it is, has it been repaired? Has it been restored? How much, to what degree? What are the problems that should all be on there? And if they won't do it, they either don't know but they're not telling you. All right, well, thank you, Robin, again. I think that'll, that'll conclude the Q&A portion. We've about three minutes over the allotted time. So thank you again. I'm now going to bring in Karen Karpovich, Executive Director of the English Speaking Union. Karen? Hi, Robin. As usual, being with you is always a joy and it's always an education. And I just wanna to say to our audience, if you're not a member, you see who our members are and uh, being part of the ESU allows you to be part of all of this. And we hope that you consider membership today. Again, at the end of the forum. I also want to mention the annual conference and the AGM, which I know we mentioned at the top of the hour or the after, after the hour, October, the 15th, 16th, and 17th. It's going to be virtual this year, and we will be celebrating our leaders, uh, past and present. So we'll have Paul Beresford Hill, we'll have leaders from the English-speaking Union of the Commonwealth, 
all speaking about the English speaking union and their leadership style and their commitment to the to the mission of Evelyn Wrench. So please join us on October the 15th for our annual meeting and our conference. Have a lovely evening and thank you again, everyone. Thank you.